Remember in the mid noughties where we got movies like this every few weeks? How do I go to my men and tell them that instead of freedom, I offer death? Spartans! Lay down your weapons! Persians! Come and get them! Well, not anymore, and I thought we'd explore why. The historical epic has been one of the most consistently produced genres in Hollywood for almost a century. As one of humanity's most accessible creative outlets, history harks back to heroes, to villains, to battles, to love stories, and to myths that have slowly evolved over hundreds, if not thousands of years. Immortality! Take it! It's yours! These adventures provide a level of carefree, exciting escapism for the viewer. Escapism that audiences have needed during times of war and other periods of social or financial uncertainty. And production companies have taken advantage of this untapped potential to make a lot of money. For reference, the seventh highest grossing movie of all time, if you account for inflation, is the 1956 biblical epic, The Ten Commandments. We'll learn if a god of shepherds is stronger than the gods of Pharaoh. And while they don't technically qualify as historical epics because they're not set in ancient times, also in the top 10 are Dr. Zhivago and the highest grossing movie by an absolute mile gone with the wind. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. So yeah, history pays. However, since the mid 2000s, the genre seems to be slowly dying. Less of these films are being made each year, and more importantly, the box office returns are proving catastrophic for production companies. For example, I watched Ridley Scott's new film, The Last Jewel recently, and thought it was really good. Bankable stars, great performances, good cinematography, and an exciting story. But it cost $100 million to make, and only made 30 million at the box office. So what is going on? Why is the genre losing its luster? Let's take a look. Before we begin, I'd better define what I mean by a historical epic. As per the impact of culture and society on the entertainment industry, a historical epic film is a large-scale film usually set in ancient times which uses high technology and production values and emphasizes visual spectacle, especially based on large-scale battle scenes and action set pieces. So yeah, it has to be set during the Middle Ages or older, and usually incorporates an action sequence. And when you think about it, this definition makes the historical epic decline even stranger, as other historical films, especially World War II epics, are going through something of a hot streak. In the last five years we've had 1917, Dunkirk, and The Imitation Game, all critically acclaimed box office hits. Keith and Charles are both fine. Excuse me. What? Your mediocre linguist and, and positively poor coat bakers. Anyway, we should probably talk about the rise before the fall and how the mid 2000s was flooded with historical epics. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? So I went through and categorized every one of these movies from the 1990s onwards based on our definition and including TV movies, grouped them by decade. Here are the stats. 1990 to 2000, there were 29. 2000 to 2010, 71. 2010 to 2020, 62. And here they are in a bar chart and a pie chart and whatever this is. So yeah, in the 2000s, Hollywood went absolutely nuts for these films. And while Mel Gibson's Braveheart acted as something of a catalyst in 1995, there was one big movie that really propelled the new wave. Ridley Scott's Gladiator. The frost. Sometimes it makes the blade stick. Gladiator was released in 2000 and it made half a billion dollars, won five Oscars, including Best Picture, and legitimized both the financial and critical potential of the genre. Am I not and coincidentally, it's my favourite film, with elements of romance, action, drama, stunning visuals and one of Hans Zimmer's best scores, Gladiator showed audiences and production companies what was possible, and what followed was an arms race to produce as many of these films as quickly as possible. Troy, 300, Kingdom of Heaven, Robin Hood, King Arthur, these became some of the most sought after projects in the industry and ended up impacting other genres in Hollywood too. It's a shilling to tie up your boat at the dock. History was suddenly cool again, and everyone knew it. And this is part of the reason I'm making this video. I'm a kid from the 90s, so these mid noughties historical epics were a large part of my introduction to the film industry. Every couple of weeks, a new one came out, and between these and the Matrix ripoffs, there wasn't much room for anything else in the action genre. I was hooked. However, by around 2006, the tides had shifted and people were burnt out. There was even an article written by Ross Do That. Do Tat? 
Ros du Dedel, in 2006 claiming that the historical epic had died with Kingdom of Heaven. And while I'm not willing to go that far, I mean, Apocalypto came out later that year, and that's an amazing film. The movies got longer, the acting got worse. I need your help, Perseus. You're the great god Zeus, you don't need my help. And the profits soon started drying up. Sure, Kingdom of Heaven made $218 million, but it cost $135 million to make. And this is where we come across our first and main problem, money. Historical epics are obscenely expensive to make. And guess what? They always have been. Back when the Hollywood studio system reigned supreme, between 1920 and 1948, film production was dominated by the five main production companies, Paramount, Warner Brothers, MGM, RKO, and Fox, which later became 20th Century Fox. They had a stranglehold on the theaters and therefore could package their bad films with more premium offerings, often referred to as A and B movies, in a double billing to ensure large profits. But in order to dump their bad films on audiences, they needed guaranteed big draw A movies. MGM realized the success of the new company depended on Ben Hur. Along with lavish musicals, the Sword and Sandal epic became one of these big attractions. Audiences were impressed with the scale, the story, the grandeur. But with scale comes cost. Sets are expensive, filming on location is expensive, and hiring extras for large set pieces is astronomically expensive. For example, 1925's Ben-Hur hired 15,000 extras for the famous chariot race. And this led to it being the most expensive film ever made for about 20 years. For the most expensive picture of the entire silent era, the gold Goldwyn Company went on location to Italy. These same costs face modern productions as the need for location shoots, large constructed sets, costuming, additional special effects, and a huge cast of extras leads to a huge budget. Put simply, you want to be epic? You've got to pay an epic price. Here's a 10 movie sample with some of the better known movies from the last 20 years. As you can see, the only film with a budget below $100 million was 300. And the average budget for all of these films, 134 million. That's a lot of money to spend on a movie that has two most likely outcomes. Best case, you double your money. Worst case, you get absolutely murdered and lose over 50 million. And while losing $50 million probably stings, the opportunity cost is what hurts a production company more. For such a huge budget, the company could have financed five or six drama or comedy movies instead and received the potential profits and critical acclaim that came from them. So when historical epics started consistently bombing in the 2010s, production companies soon realized that the risk of putting all their eggs in one basket was no longer financially viable. For example, King Arthur Legend of the Sword was meant to kickstart a six film franchise, but then it lost $20 million. Robin Hood lost 15 million. Gods of Egypt lost 10 million. And The Last Duel lost $70 million. And this talk of box office bombs brings brings us to today. Avengers! Franchises rule the box office. That's an undisputed fact. If you look at the highest grossing films of all time, six of the top 10 are from established franchises. And if we add remakes and sequels to the franchise categorization, only Titanic and Avatar remain. If we expand it to top 20, there are no other standalone films. Top 30, again, none. It isn't until Joker at 31 that you find one, and this is still intellectual property from the DC franchise. The next movie, probably Alice in Wonderland down at number Number 44. I need to pick here. Franchises have always existed, but the fact that intellectual property darlings now dominate the box office is devastating for historical epics. It's becoming increasingly difficult to obtain funding for an original, standalone story in any genre, let alone one with a huge budget. Basically, if you're not from one of the following franchises or a Disney movie, you're not getting $100 million to make a movie without a fight. And while I have no evidence to support this, it seems like the rapid advancement of special effects means the excitement of a medieval battle has now been substituted for the explosive surreality of modern sci-fi action. Special effects now provide limitless possibilities for superhero set pieces, and audiences can't get enough. However, we've also got to discuss the big elephant in the room affecting historical epics, changing social values in Hollywood. Some Egyptians said that this is whitewashing. That's what they yeah. said. 
How do you respond to that? Now, I'm not here to pass comment on whether the world has gone soft, whether we're all snowflakes, whether everyone is too precious these days. I don't think I'm the person to be having that conversation. But it's impossible to ignore how much Hollywood has mirrored the evolution of modern social values. More specifically, how much more aware Hollywood is of public backlash and the speed with which they try to appease angry audiences. I mean, the public basically bullied Warner Brothers into spending an additional $70 million because they didn't like the first Justice League. That's how much power social media has given the viewer. But how has this impacted historical epics? Well, casting controversies. Once the concept of whitewashing gained traction, historical films got battered. With mostly white actors cast in the role of non-white historical characters, they became easy targets for social activists. For example, 2014's Noah and Exodus Gods and Kings were both criticised for casting white actors in biblical roles. Moreover, Gal Gadot is currently embroiled in controversy over her upcoming Cleopatra film, in which she, an Israeli actress, will play the Egyptian queen. If you want to be truth to the facts, then Cleopatra was Macedonian. When trying to adapt foreign texts and multicultural characters, these problems became unavoidable for a white-dominated Hollywood. Now, I'm not saying shirking this criticism is the main reason Hollywood stopped making historical epics, but say you're the head of a production company, which would you choose? Number one, make another superhero franchise blockbuster that is guaranteed to make a profit and features fictional alien races, and therefore conveniently avoids any whitewashing controversy. Or number two, create an original but expensive historical epic that is a huge financial risk and will likely require specific cultural casting choices to avoid public backlash. If you're thinking dollars and reputation, the choice is almost too simple. There's also another train of thought that this culture of increased social scrutiny has led to the dismissal of conventional historical narratives for untold truths. For instance, Daniel Troy highlights that more movies than ever are being produced by black creators about America's unrepresented black history. Selma, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Judas and the Black Messiah. The appetite for lesser known, underrepresented history is palpable and is eating into the interest for older historical texts. So let's look to the future. Despite everything I've said today, it's stupid to say historical epics are dead. The fantasy genre is still as strong as ever, and many fantasy stories draw characterization, setting, and thematic inspiration from ancient historical legends. So the appetite's still there. Game of Thrones was a juggernaut and only finished a few years ago. The Witcher is popular. Amazon paid a boatload of money for the Wheel of Time adaptation. And if we're talking historical epics, it's not like none are being made. The Green Knight only came out earlier this year. The King and Outlaw King were made on Netflix. Gal Dodd is starring in her upcoming Cleopatra adaptation, and Denis Villeneuve has also announced that he will be making his own Cleopatra epic. Therefore, if we're hunting for silver linings, directors are trying, and some of these projects are being greenlit. It also goes without saying that Hollywood, like any entertainment product, comes in waves. When superhero movies inevitably show a sign of weakness, which sounds ridiculous right now, but it will happen eventually, production companies will have billions of dollars to use on the next big thing. And say one of the Cleopatra films takes off like Gladys that would trigger an arms race and reignite the genre. Ah, uh, boy can dream, right? Maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe the genre will inevitably die, but I'm hoping like hell it doesn't. I love history and I love it being shown in cinema. Let me know what you think about the future of historical epics down in the comments below, and until next time, see you gang. Bye.